Welcome to Greenville Academically Speaking, a weekly presentation by the University Center of Greenville at McAllister Square, designed to showcase the teaching and research interests of faculty from the center's seven affiliated universities. Now your host, Joan Martin. Good morning and welcome again to Greenville Academically Speaking. Our guest this morning is Dr. David Shainer, Professor of Philosophy and Asian Studies, as well as Chair of the Department of Philosophy at Furman University. Good morning, Dr. Shainer. Good morning, Joan. How are you? Well, I... You can hear I'm wheezing, so you'll have to excuse me. I've got a sinus infection, but we're going to let you do most of the talking okay. this morning well, anyway. It's just like my kids at home. We're, oh, really? we're going through that as well. Oh, okay. <laughs> so far, it, I've escaped. Oh, good. <laughs> good. You know, uh, I was looking over your background. I, it's really overwhelming, and I hope I have this chronologically correct. First of all, you've been teaching at Furman for 26 years? That's correct. Too bad this isn't television. You could see that he looks about 30 years old. So I find that really remarkable. But then on top of that, you... Um, You're very kind. You're probably going to ask me some tough questions now. <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> but uh, you received your... Let me see if I've got this correct. You received your Ph.D., from the University of Hawaii in Contemporary Philosophy? Comparative Philosophy. Comparative Philosophy, okay. And then in 85 and 86, you were a faculty fellow at uh, Harvard University? That's correct. Now, in between, you've managed to find time to write. You've had two books published, and two more are in the works, you said? Yeah, well, they're, they're finished, but I'm being represented by a literary agency in New York. Oh, that's great. Um, I decided to break out and try to uh, write for a general readership. So, All right, what are, what are the subjects? Let's well, the, these two books, uh, the new ones, are one is on uh, personal development. That is, everyone is seeking to improve their lives in some way. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it's a book, uh, I wouldn't call it self-help, but kind of a directed learning on if you want to uh, achieve this goal, then, then here are, it's actually called Connect, Seven Arts for Positive Personal Transformation. Seven Arts. Arts. Seven Arts. And then there's a companion book called connect seven arts for uh, organizational transformation uh, what, what do you the word arts what does that mean in this context well I would think there are strategies for learning yes okay steps. that that um, um, I don't want to go into it too early but yeah. uh, for example the art of preparation the art of compassion oh, the I art of responsibility see. and it goes on and they're sequential they're stage like uh -huh. so you have to work on one first and then the next and then the next oh yeah I like that that you you have a goal to achieve then exactly yeah okay besides that no you've got those two other books but then you also have a book series we yes, were talking before yes. the show you, you have a book series uh, with the uh, state university of new york press and you're the editor in some 40 volumes in yes well i think it's more like 38 volumes oh darn um, <laughs> 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 that um, is so impressive. Well, I'm I've been busy. Yeah. <laughs> so, now, uh, besides doing all of this, you are also you also have your own sort of sideline business as far as a consultant yes. to uh, corporations and individuals and athletes. Yes. As far as performance improvement. Performance improvement, it, and and that was the inspiration. I've been doing that for about twenty five years. So that was the inspiration. That was the inspiration books. to finally say, you know, I, I've learned these strategies that really work. Uh, my students and clients have borne borne out mm -hmm. that they do work, and so I thought, you know, rather than um, just keeping this to myself and teaching my clients that I would try to write these same strategies for athletes, for musicians, for individual executives, and also for very large companies. I've had the pleasure of working yeah, with some right. very large companies. But, but I'm trying to tie this in. You teach philosophy, so yes. this ties in with the yes. philosophy yes. end of it. Yes. The, the common denominator there mm -hmm. is I've had a lifelong interest in um, human performance, uh, from a very young age. Uh oh, I think I'm going to be rated after the show. <laughs> <laughs> you know, every, everyone everyone wants to improve. Yeah, of and course. everyone finds it difficult to change. And so the, oh, that's true. you know, we're habit driven. And so the difficulty mm. is what are the strategies that I can learn to help improve my performance? And that's been a lifelong goal that actually started when I was very young as an athlete. And then that's what actually led me in college to philosophy and specifically Asian philosophy, mm. because I was learning different strategies of how to accomplish goals. And I was just fascinated by it and had the good fortune to have exposure to 
uh, the best Japanese teachers from an early age. And um, in fact, my teacher now, who I started studying with when I was uh, 15 years old, is now 88. <gasps> and wow. next April, it'll be my 40th year as his student. All right. Now, that's fascinating in itself. But what is more fascinating is how did you connect with him when you were 15 years old where where were you where are you from are you from Hawaii? No, i'm from the midwest um oh, okay. i'm from a suburb of chicago um uh, i'll tell you uh, i guess i'll yes, reveal just some, a personal oh you, yes you said of we're course. just having this conversation it's just you and i right right just yeah, just you yeah. and i nobody's listening um you, you know when i was young um both my parents are deceased um but Upon reflection, my father was very uh, strict. He was like a Marine drill sergeant. Ooh. But my mother was like the theologian in the family. Mm. So I think I'm the product of my father who instilled in me um, uh, discipline. discipline right. And a, a kind of a, a fascination with spirituality mm. from an early age with my mother. In fact, um, when I was, I remember, I think I was in the seventh grade. You know how you go through, uh, in the Christian tradition, you go through confirmation mm, processes, oh yeah, both you know, Protestant or catechism if you're yeah. Catholic. Well, uh, I went to the very first class in the summer. It was summer mm-hmm. study. And the minister said, um, we're going to go through this summer study. And in the fall, there'll be a special uh, service where you will all become adult members of the church. Mm. You know, you'll, you'll graduate. That's impressive for a child to hear well, that, yes. Y- yes, but as a child, I immediately realized I'm just a kid what do you mean an adult member of the church you were what about seven or eight you said uh no seventh grade seventh so grade. what's that okay. I was uh 11, 11 12, or 12 yeah. yeah so uh interestingly I came home and I told my mother you know I can't do this and she looked at me hmm. like you're a clever young kid what's your excuse to yeah. get out of summer religious study and I said well, if I choose, this was the Methodist church, if I choose to become a member of this church, it should be a meaningful choice. And I don't know any other religion other than what I've been taught going to the Barrington Methodist Church. And she you were said, a smart little kid. Well, I, w- I was curious. At the time, I didn't really think of it as anything other than you know, I got the this curiosity. lecture, yeah, that this was a very responsible thing, and you're going to be an adult member. But mm-hmm. I was, I knew I'm not an adult, I'm like 11 years old. And so I said, I, I want to study other religions so that I can make this a meaningful choice. And my mother said, okay, you don't have to do this. But this summer, I will be your tutor. And together, we will study oh. world religions. Oh, how wonderful. I, I give my mother so much credit to this oh, because yes. it instilled in me a lifetime curiosity of mm-hmm. spirituality, both East and West. Right. Um, so I feel very, very grateful for that. Mm, and, you um, were really blessed to have I, a mother I'm very, like that. I'm very yeah. grateful for both my parents mm-hmm. and, and all of the lessons that... Um, they taught, and so um, you know. So here you we embarked are. <laughs> on this whole this whole summer. <clears throat> yes, and, and then to get back to your other question, so I was um, a ski racer, snow skiing, at seventh grade. Yes, and actually, uh, I went on and competed in college, and w- was actually on the um, it was called the uh, Olympic Valley USA ski oh, team in, in the seventies. Fantastic. And my hero in 1968. But just to date ourselves, right, mm. was Jean-Claude Keeley. And he won three oh, gold yes, medals yeah. in the Grenoble Winter Olympics. Mm-hmm. And he won by just thousands or hundredths of a second. And, and I, you know, I wanted to be just like Jean-Claude. Mm. And they said, Jean-Claude, what's the key to your success? And he said, I do yoga. I mm. do breathing and meditation. And if it's good enough for the Olympic gold medalist and world champion, then it was good enough for the (laughs) the, the U.S. ski team. Yes. And so um, where I was uh, training in Squaw Valley, California, um, they they exposed us. um, Well, actually, earlier. You're still talking about seventh grade, 11, 12 years old. Well, no, I'm I'm moving the clock up. I'm moving the clock up. Um, So when I was this was when I was about 15. Mm I, w- I began to be exposed to breathing and meditation, mm-hmm. all purely for sports psychology. With you know, I, I, it wasn't a spiritual thing. Right. Yeah, I just wanted to ski fast. Yeah. And, and Jean-Claude was my hero. He does this, you know, the mm-hmm. mental side so of sports. So it must be good for me, must too. must be good for me, too. And at the same time, I saw uh, an Aikido demonstration where the, 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 the teacher was talking about the same principles of the power of the mind, but mm-hmm. rather than just sitting still, which was hard for me at 14, 15 mm-hmm. years old, 
um, it, it was martial arts. And so he was able, you know, he was throwing people around like they were a piece of paper. And I said, what kind of power is this? I don't understand. Mm. And yet, um, so I immediately switched because he was talking about the same mental principles, but you could move. You know, it was kind of a macho thing, right, martial yeah. arts, you know. And um, due to the good fortune, I guess, because of my athletic ability, when I continued to train with him when he was in this country, he would use me as what is called the uke or the person that he would demonstrate with because oh, he felt he could throw me with power to demonstrate, uh -huh. but I wouldn't break. You know, I was, yes, I was athletic. Exactly. And, and now, where, where would you said when he was in this country so he would come back to this country yes. to the chicago he, he, area well, where yes. you lived uh, yes and and actually more at this point now I, I was starting a college as a ski racer in the pacific northwest ah. um, on a on an athletic scholarship mm -hmm. and the closer you get to the west coast in hawaii that's where he was more often ah, i see and by the way his name is koichi tohei Koichi Tohei, mm -hmm. and he is the founder of what's called Shinshin Toetsu Aikido. It's, it's a martial art. And he was the first to bring Aikido out of Japan in 1953. He took a, a steamship from Japan oh. to Hawaii. And um, uh, so I, I'm blessed with kind of a like, I've been a lifelong pupil of him, and his, his teaching is Mind Leads Body. He, he mind what? Mind leads body. Mind leads, leads body. body. In other words, your mind controls everything to do with your behavior. Hmm. And he would teach those principles in the martial arts to show that if you use your mind in one way, it's very effective. But if you m use your mind in another way, then it's not effective. Hmm. So that actually led me when I was in college to study philosophy because I was so interested in what is this non-Western philosophy that hmm. teaches. Here's another thing that will surprise you. You're stronger relaxed. Everyone thinks, oh, if I'm strong, if I yes, tense my muscle yeah, like this, I'm right. showing you my bicep. But actually, all that does is constrict your energy. When you relax your mind and learn how to direct your power. Right. Oh, I see. That's 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 real strength. I mean, look at any Olympic athlete, and you see that they they function well if you're relaxed. They're a baseball player. You can't hit a ninety mile an hour fastball unless you're relaxed. Yeah. So um, anyway, I learned these principles and have been trying to apply them to a variety of disciplines. And actually, that martial arts training came first. Then in college, I wanted to learn more about it, so I started studying non-Western philosophy, Japanese philosophy, mm -hmm. Chinese philosophy, Indian philosophy. That led to my going to graduate school at the University of Hawaii, where I could continue to train with my teacher, and the East-West Center is really the best school of comparative philosophy. Mm. Uh, you know, I'd have to toot right, my, right. my alma mater. Well, of course. Of course. Um, uh, and and uh, essentially then uh, through that relationship uh, during graduate school, during my dissertation writing, I actually lived with him in Japan, what's called Kiki. Uchideshi. I it's was like, going to ask how you focused on Japan because you said this. Well, was, he's Japanese. Yes, and, uh, you had China, India, uh, all these other philosoph yes. philosophical cultures to choose from. Well, that's true, and and I actually started my master's degree was in early Buddhist philosophy, where the mm. focus was in Pali and Sanskrit, uh, and then I, I I moved. I tried to follow it chronologically, actually, from India, and then I did uh, work with Chang Ying Chang uh, at the University of Hawaii in Chinese philosophy. All right, wait a minute, stop. You said mm -hmm. you you followed it chronologically are you saying that that this um, mind body uh, connection started in India yes. and evolved yes oh. you know when you when you study the history of uh, Western culture mm -hmm. um, you know you might you know start in you know classically you know Egypt or Mesopotamia and then you just follow right exactly. you know the uh, kind of uh, the intellectual history and in Asia um, you'll begin with the Vedas the earliest uh, literature um, within the Indian philosophy philosophical tradition and follow that through what's called the Aryankas, the Brahmanas, the Upanishads. Uh, and, and, and then you, you, you come to the historical Buddha, Siddhartha mm. Gautama. And his early texts were written in Pali, uh, the Pali Nikayas and the Chinese Agamas. All right. Now, Buddha, mm -hmm. was he really, I'm, I'm showing my ignorance here, he, <laughs> okay. but, but he, uh, India yes. acknowledged Buddha. Uh, actually, Buddhism is considered a heterodox school of Indian philosophy. What does that mean? Orthodoxy is the belief in the, the classical um, Indian philosophical school that's referred to as, there's actually six classical schools, but probably the most famous is called Advaita Vedanta. And let's just, to keep it simple, mm. it holds certain tenets that became considered orthodoxy I see, within I the see. 
Indian philosophical right, tradition. Right. Well, Siddhartha, through a life of his own tra- uh, training, uh, disagreed with mm. some of those key concepts. So while he is prized as clearly, you know, a visionary philosophical spiritual mm-hmm. leader, his uh, some of the essential elements of his teaching uh, are so different that early Buddhism is considered a heterodox school. And with then various. Y- y- yes, I ex- see. Exactly. And, and Buddhism, by the way, is extremely diverse. If someone comes up to me and they say, oh, I hear you're a Buddhist scholar, I'm a Buddhist. That, that really doesn't tell me really? anything. Because there are, it is so diverse. Buddhism is I much more. I never realized that. Yes. Well, within Christianity, for example, uh, you've got um, uh, a single canon, the Bible, right, exactly. Old Testament, New Testament. You could include the Gnostic Gospels. Mm-hmm. And you um, have Jesus as the... Yeah, yeah you've got the, you've got the, the leader, Trinity right? And so forth. And so, of course, we have diversity, uh, Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, mm-hmm. Episcopalian, you know, uh, Protestant. Uh, but within Buddhism, um, there's much greater diversity because upon Siddhartha's deathbed, he said, let the teachings be the teacher. In other words, he did not mm. appoint his senior student, as was expected oh. to be. It's kind of like apostolic succession, the right. ring of St. Peter. Yes, exactly. And, um, instead, you know, there he is. Imagine he's, you know, on his deathbed, and people are expecting him to appoint yes, somebody uh, Ananda, to his yes. number one pupil. And instead, he said, let the teachings be the teacher. Or sometimes it's translated as, let the teachings be a light unto themselves. And from that... So there's no one who... who interprets the teachings well no everyone can interpret the teachings that's the thing uh-huh. imagine uh, you and i are pupils of siddhartha hmm. we're sitting around 15 of us right. and we're the senior ones right and our teacher dies and he says with his last breath let the teachings be the teacher you and i are going to look at each other and say did you take notes was there a video yeah, camera? Right. Yeah. Did we audio tape we him? Agree? Do we have an interview? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and, and suddenly, just like my students at Furman, if you were to um, sit them down, I give a lecture, and there's 20 students in the class, and then afterwards, we go back and say, let's look at all of your notes. Oh, You're going to get 20 different versions. That's true. That's yeah. exactly what happened when Siddhartha died. <laughs> mm. So there's no one right. Well, correct. There's Instead, there's many different schools who might trace their lineage I to what see. they think um, back is to the s- correct teachings going back to the historical Buddha. Mm-hmm. So really, Buddhism is very diverse in South Asia, in China, Tibet, Korea, Japan. It's, it's right, Now you're diverse. saying Siddhartha died. In, he, he was Indian. Yes. Then it it had moved yes. before he died to other no, areas? Uh, no, after his death. Then um, Buddhism in what's referred to as the Mahayana tradition went north, and in the Hinayana or Theravada tradition, it, it stayed in the south. But, ah, okay. but um, in saying let the teachings be the teacher, that meant that if you are a living patriarch or a living what's called a Dharma leader, mm. then your interpretation of how to interpret the teachings in, in today, like present day reality, right. like 2008 in America, then it's incumbent upon uh, the Buddhist community then to interpret the teachings in light of the present circumstances. Mm. Oh, I see. You see, so, so actually there's a That's built-in evolution, a built-in way to keep the teachings contemporary. It is fascinating, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Um, so then it, it it went to China from there, yes, went to yeah, Japan from yes, there. Yes, and, and to link back with my teacher then, what does Buddhism have to do with Aikido or what does mm. it have to do with performance improvement? The, the idea that I latched on to uh, springs from the idea that um, the Asian philosophical worldview is what in philosophy we call monism. Monism is the belief that all things are one. What I mean by that is all things are interconnected. Contrast that to monotheism, the Mm -hmm. belief in a single transcendent deity, of which Islam, uh, Judaism, Christianity Mm -hmm. are all monotheistic. Polytheistic would be be the belief in many gods, right? Henotheistic is when you extol one of the polytheistic gods above others. But monism is simply the belief that all things in this universe all are interconnected and even divine. Such as you, me, the dogs, the cats, the plants. Exactly. It's actually an illusion, they would say, that you're sitting over there with your cup of coffee, I'm sitting over mm-hmm. here with my cup of coffee, and we think that we're these separate beings. but. Something that Jesus taught, as did Siddhartha, is a concept called selflessness, 
we ought to be selfless. Mm -hmm. In other words, we ought to kind of not be motivated by our own ego that comes from looking at the world as separate. Um, uh, so a, a simple example of this would be, um, let me ask you a question. How long can you live without food, Joan? Well, um, you know, probably a couple of hours, and I'm, I'm ravenous. <laughs> <laughs> but but in, uh, honest, uh, honestly, uh, I, I heard good. somewhere, we, I was talking to someone the other day and about this very thing, and they said, well, you can actually fast for three weeks Good. as long as you have water. Oh, you're wonderful. I was just talking about this to my students. Oh, and you? Yeah, okay. you just got the important yeah, and thing. As, matter as fact, long as you I, have water. Yeah, I, I fast, but uh, but the most I can do, it, I have a friend who will fast for four days. Yes. The most I can do is two days. Okay, okay. Well, there, there are various strategies of fasting, too, which is a very important way to cleanse yourself. Mm. But let's just say, you know, sometimes we hear about someone protesting, they're in prison or jail, right, hunger strike. Right, they go on a hunger so strike. So if you've, if you've got you know, water, maybe it's 30 days, 40 days, 60 days, depending on your metabolism mm-hmm. and body weight and all that. Okay, but but the point is, is we need to take things from the outside in, or we will die, right? Mm-hmm. Let's take, let's wind the clock closer. How long can you live without food? Well, I, excuse me, excuse me, I said I, food, it's the same thing. I meant water, uh, I, my bad. Water. <laughs> yeah, I... I want to say probably four or five days. Very good. Correct? Maybe three to five days. Yeah. And, and, and dehydrating is a, is a Must terrible... Be a- it, horrible it, way to go. A horrible. Yes. In fact, and you, you may know if you've been familiar with people like hospice assisting oh, with yes, the dying yeah. process. You, you, you need to keep the tongue and the lips moist, right, right. even if they can't take in any more food yeah. or water. It's just to eliminate suffering. Mm-hmm. But, but, but let's keep on the point. You can't live without food for, say, 30 days. Can't live without water for three right, days. Right. How long, Joan, can you live without air? Oh, probably just a matter of minutes, yes. obviously. Yeah. So with these three examples, I'm just kind of pointing out something obvious, but we don't think about. Mm-hmm. Our life and our energy requires an interconnection with the environment, food, water, and air sustains us all the time. But that food, water, and air doesn't stop there. Uh, the Buddhist philosopher would argue that you and I literally are not separate beings. What causes me to act selflessly and with compassion is I feel deeply connected to you, I see. to nature, and from that feeling of connection, you see, what this, that, you know what this sounds like? Yes. The golden rule. Yeah, I was just going to say that. <laughs> do unto others. It's yes, the, yes, it's the same. So why is it that you do unto others? Not because someone told you so, but what if you deeply felt yeah. so connected to others that you would be acting selflessly? Mm-hmm. In a sense, compassion is the result of your mindset of connection. Let me think about that. Compassion mm-hmm. is the result. That's true. If you if you feel connected yes. to other people, you're yes. going. To, if you feel connected to animals, whatever. Yes, yes. trees, trees, anything, yes. anything, and that's really you know. Someone might look at me and go, Shaner, you're crazy, but you know that's that's where meditation comes in. Mm. When you calm yourself, achieve levels of deep calmness. That's when. Literally, you stop thinking, judging, blaming, criticizing. Mm -hmm. When you stop all that self-talk, you know that little voice in your head that's always talking to yourself? Oh, yes. (laughs) Students say, what voice? And I said, the voice right now that's saying, I don't have a voice. Yeah, I don't have a voice. (laughs) (laughs) So in a sense, (laughs) when we think, it's like we're talking to ourselves. Yeah. Uh, So in any event, that's why within the Buddhist tradition, various practices are there to develop your awareness your mindfulness, and your attention to detail. Because when you're very calm, it's more like your mind is like a mirror that reflects all things clearly. Can you not carry this compassion to... in the opposite direction to the ultimate where you you feel so connected that you lose your selflessness, your own self? Uh, Well, what you do when you lose your own self, you embrace selflessness. And so... In other words, that's a much, it's, it's a much greater thing to let go of your small self. Mm-hmm. In Japanese, we call it shoga. 
is the smaller Shoga? self. Shoga means small self, mm. as opposed to taiga, a greater self, mm-hmm. is really not yourself that's, you know, standing right. here, uh, Joan, uh, looking at me. It's the greater self is yes. your connection. So, in other words, when a spider gets got into my kitchen the other day, <laughs> and I, I really hate spiders, yeah. but. I I suddenly felt that connection with, poor thing, what is he doing in here? And I went to the trouble of getting a glass and and I managed to put him outside. Good for you. Um, (laughs) I felt, you know, much as my hair was standing on end, I I felt that connection with this is, of course, he was rather large, too. And I felt a connection with an animal. And I think, you know, you... That's probably what you're talking yeah, about. That, but that's, on a, that, that's on a very basic. It, it's a, it's a very basic level. Primal level, yes. But you know the the fascinating thing that is why I love what I do and and all of the mm. you know even carrying this into the business world. You'd think, are you crazy? What does this have to do with you know buy low, sell high, profit is revenue mm-hmm. less cost? When you have a compassionate organization. When you actually treat employees the way Thank they deserve you. to yes. be treated, yes, you will get. All kinds of productivity, care, ownership exactly. for the product, ownership for the company, as opposed to the, the flag and, to, and, 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 you know, the, the yeah, waving exactly. the banner, quality yeah. is job one, whatever. That's right. Let's cheerlead um, for the company. Yeah, let's cheerlead. Yeah. You know, people are sophisticated. They see through that. Yeah. But if you can truly uh, create an organization where there is genuine um, compassion, you will get a genuinely responsible employee. Business must be booming or should be <laughs> booming for you because uh, over the years, and I'm, I'm showing my age too, but over the years I feel as though companies are becoming less and less and less compassionate. And, uh, you know, we're going to make a move. We're going to move your office. It's a done deal. Yeah, and you yeah. say, oh, but wait a minute. You know, there are, couldn't I have some input? No, you're moving there. Exactly. Uh, or this, shipping jobs overseas. Sh- that's right. How about the that's textile industry wonderful. right here? Uh, wonderful example absolutely Hor- horrible example but well that's but, true but you know there there are ways to um if you involve employees and inst- instead of mm-hmm. like trying to keep the secrets i call it boardroom awareness right if exactly. every employee had the awareness of the competitors the market the pricing mm-hmm. new technologies if you just shared all that information interest exactly in making the doing the best they they possibly can exactly because you treat them with respect you give them all the information mm-hmm. That it, is it's, what, it's pretty basic. I can't believe we're out. I can't. We're out of time. How many, inter- <laughs> how many interviews? I may, I may, instead of coming back next week, I may have you come back two weeks. Oh. More. <laughs> well, I'd love so to come many. back. You, yeah, you've been well, very kind. All right, fine. Well, you're going to come back next Saturday, and we're, we're going to all continue right. this. Our guest this morning has been uh, Dr. David Shainer. Professor of Philosophy and Asian Studies. We're going to get into what you actually teach. I want to hear about those Asian studies, too. And you're also chair of the Department of Philosophy at Furman University. Tune in again next Saturday morning at 10 a.m. as we continue our discuss- discussion with Dr. Shainer. I'm Joan Martin, and you've been listening to Greenville, academically speaking, right here on WOLT 103.3. FM. Greenville Academically Speaking is a production of the University Center of Greenville. Greenville Academically Speaking is a weekly presentation of the University Center of Greenville at McAllister Square, a consortium including Clemson, Furman, Lander, Medical University of South Carolina, South Carolina State, USC, and USC Upstate. Greenville Academically Speaking is presented every Saturday morning from 10 till 1030 here at 103.3 WOLT.